Um, he, um, Mike lives near Guelph, gets to go birding near there as much as he can. And um, he's really helping steer this project um, and um, is the person that uh, can tell us about the Atlas and um, help get this going. So I'd like to turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Lynn. Appreciate that. Great introduction. Um, it, it's a bit disconcerting. I'm going to interrupt you. Sorry, I forgot to say logistics. Uh, Mike's going to do his presentation and we're going to hold questions to the end. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat. And um, Sarah Rupert is moderating this and we'll make sure that all your questions get answered. Sorry for interrupting, Mike. I will okay. Thanks, Lynn. Um, yeah, a great. A, it's funny doing this presentation without being able to see you all. I'm sure there's lots of old friends in the audience there who participated in past um, atlases and Unfortunately, I can't see you, but anyway, um, I hope this will all be very familiar to you. And for all of those of you who are new to this, I'm excited that you're interested in the project and hopefully we can convince you to take, take part in this. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here and pull up the presentation. And hopefully everybody can see that. Pop that up so you get the full screen view. Okay, well, this presentation is uh, a webinar for the Ontario Field Ornithologists. That logo in the middle of the screen there is the logo from Atlas II. We are actually going to have a logo contest in the coming weeks to uh, find a new logo and hoping to get everybody involved in that. We'll be, uh, we'll be getting votes going on that one uh, over the next month or so. Our um, web address is there and we'll be coming back to that at the end. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce Kaylin Bumelis, who's the assistant coordinator on the project. When you email the project, um, you are be, you'll be communicating with with Kaylin. Uh, Kaylin, can you show yourself? Can we show you? There's Hi Kaylin. everyone. I'm Kaylin. I'm looking forward to communicating with some of you. Um, I've already chatted with a few of you already, so I'm looking forward to 2021. Great. Thanks, Kaylin. Okay, so I'll just skip through down through the slides. I'm hoping this will take about 40, 45 minutes and we'll have a chance at the end for some questions. I think as everybody said, um, if you do have questions you want to raise during the course of this, just put things on the chat and uh, Sarah and others will coordinate that and we'll, we'll be able to bring those questions up at the end. So as Lynn mentioned, uh, five sponsoring organizations for the project, uh, the same five sponsoring organizations that uh, um, were involved in Atlas II. There have been two previous Atlas projects. First one was from 1981 to 1985, and the next one was 2001 to 2005. Each of them resulted in a, a big, thick book that summarizing all the results of the, of the project. Um, at this point, we're not actually sure that we're going to produce a book this time with all the opportunities to do things on the uh, on the web to have our results summarized there. But the, those discussions are still underway and, and we'll be looking for some input on that along the way. The project is um, managed through a, a, an overseeing management committee that made up, made up of representatives of those five organizations. But as you can see, there's quite an infrastructure underneath that management committee. We have six committees uh, that are running the day-to-day -day operations of the project and, and various subcommittees and working groups. I'll just maybe briefly quickly run through those. So the Significant Species Committee is helping us decide which species um, we need to be documenting in more, in more detail and, and how, to, how to document them, what documentation is required, and they will be involved in reviewing those and making sure that the records are, are uh, in good shape. We have a volunteer management committee that Lynn coordinates that um, helps make sure that we're doing things in such a way that they're suitable for, for you, the birders, the, the volunteers in the project. The technical committee is the one that's uh, involved in designing the whole thing and um, overseeing all the, all the technical aspects of it from the, from the database management through uh, to how are we going to cover Northern Ontario and um, what specific design are we going to have for this, for this project. 
Um, obviously, finance and fundraising is an important part uh, part of the project. We have a communications committee that's helped. That you may have noticed today our uh, our website just got launched, the full version of the website. Uh, we've got the Twitter account and the Instagram up and running now. So if you haven't uh, signed on for those, please do so. And new for this atlas, we have an Indigenous Engagement Committee. Obviously, um, in, in this day and age, there's a need to uh, enhance involvement of the Indigenous community in the, in the atlas and try and make sure the data is as useful as possible for the Indigenous community. So um, we're just starting the outreach on that aspect of the project um, in the next few weeks. Staff-wise, is myself and Kaylin that are sort of pretty much devoted full-time to the uh, project. Kaylin works for Birds Canada. I work for Canadian Wildlife Service. Um, we have uh, Denis Lepage, who manages the database and really has overseen the design of atlasing right across Canada, the whole, the whole database sit, uh, system for Birds Canada, and is instrumental to, uh, to the day-to-day -day management of, of everything that goes on behind the scenes. Um, Andrew Couturier down at Birds Canada is the uh, our mapping manager, GIS expert. And then we have a number of technicians who, who are going to be coming and going over the course of the, of the Atlas period. And we do have field crews. We hire crews every year to fill in gaps in coverage, um, particularly it turns out to central Ontario, northern Ontario, where there are fuel birders on the ground. And actually, maybe I'll mention it now, if there are students out there that are interested in working on the, on the project, uh, maybe uh, email, email us and let us know, and we'll be starting to look for people in the, uh, in the late winter. Uh, I'll go into it in more detail, but we do have 47 regions, and we have regional coordinators lined up for all of those. What we don't know at this point is how many volunteers we're going to have. Um, data collection doesn't start for another few months, so we're, we're going to start building that up uh, following today's presentation. So the goals uh, overall of the Atlas are still being to some extent tweaked, but they're basically as, as laid out here. It's really all about determining and mapping the distribution and the relative abundance of the breeding birds of this province over the next five years. And then we want to compare that to previous atlases so we can see how those things have changed. We want to um, be able to assess the population size of the birds and how that's compared to previous atlases. Um, we want to gather specific information on where these birds are nesting and um, how many of their, how many there are of some of the uh, significant species, such as the, the species at risk. We this time a particular goal of expanding and enhancing coverage in the north. And um, we want to make sure all of this is all about collecting the data to get that data out there for conservationists and researchers to apply in helping um, conserve the birds of the province, to learn more about them and uh, get those conservation projects um, as, as fully, um, fully documented and fully, uh, fully stocked with data as we can possibly make it. So in other words, the Atlas is... It's an all hands on deck, no holds barred, pull out all the stops inventory of the birds of the province, powered by, as Lynn said, by the birding community. Really, we just want to get as many people as we can out there collecting data on the birds and covering the whole province. And really, we need the whole community buying into this for it to, uh, for it to be successful. And it's, uh, as you saw there with our goal being to get uh, information on for the conservation purposes, it really is just about the most useful thing that you can do as a birder is to get information into this project. And luckily for us, and you'll, I hope you'll find the same thing, it's really an enjoyable thing to be doing as well. So the way the project works, we divided up uh, the province up into regions. We have 47 of them. Um, Parts of three of them are shown here, and I should say these maps um, are available on the website. These are all old maps from Atlas II, and we will be updating all those, but just to give you an idea of, of the lay of the land. So each of these regions varies from probably 20 up to, uh, I think the largest region we have in the south is Algonquin Park with about 140 squares in it. So the data is collected inside each of these regions by 10 by 10 kilometer squares. And there's about 2,000 of those squares in southern Ontario. And our goal is to get every one of those covered. Key 
key to this is our regional coordinators, 47 regions, 47 sets of regional coordinators. And um, we have up to three or four coordinators in, in some regions dividing up the tasks. So this is the uh, on the new website. If you haven't seen that yet, have a look on the website. Um, you can see um, the list of regional coordinators there, all with their bios and pictures, so you can see who you're operating with. And there's a small map there of the regions. You can zoom in on that, click on the region th uh, that you're interested in, zoom right into a square and see if there's a square that you're interested in, get in touch with that coordinator and, and start the ball rolling on the project. So zooming in a bit to these 10 by 10 kilometer squares, we'll have maps like this for every square in the province. And uh, certainly all the roaded squares in the province in the southern two-thirds of the province. Um, we'll have maps like this showing the entire road system and then the basic topographic and general habitat features of the square. And so I should mention that in southern Ontario, a square like this probably has about 100 species nesting in it. And your job as an atlaser is to try and find as many of those birds as you can that are nesting in the square. So you can use this map to give you some clues as to how you might go about doing that. Obviously, the key is hitting all of the different habitats in that square. So you can see the topographic map in and of itself gives you quite a bit of information where the roads are, where the river is. In this case, it shows you the lakes, it shows you the wetlands, it shows you the woodlands, the open habitats, it shows you the contours. You can see where the hills and valleys are, the urban areas. So it's really a great tool for laying out your strategy for how you're going to go about finding as many species as you can in that square. There are a whole bunch of numbers on here, and I'll come back. Those number, numbered locations are point counts, and I'll come back to that a little later in the presentation and explain what, what that's all about. So when you're collecting data in the square, um, we're going to be collecting data much like eBird by checklist. And so you go out into the square, you um, walk around with your phone or um, keeping track on your map of the of the. Uh, of the track that you make through the square and then you're producing a checklist of the birds that you see and hear on that on that particular outing um, and so the data will relate specifically back to that track and you're going to be recording information on the breeding evidence of each species um, that you find along the way and as it shows on the map here one of the nice things about uh, this Atlas. We couldn't do this in previous atlases because the technology wasn't there, but now you can. Say you want to collect all your data in the small conservation area down here at the, uh, the bottom left of the screen. You can collect all of your, uh, your checklist in there. And of course, that's great information for the square, but it's also potentially very useful for the conservation authority too. And um, that information will be available to them at, at a later stage of the, of the project. But your track can also be along roads, as it shows here up at the top right, or it can be a stationary point. You can find a good, a good, um, a good spot and hang around there for however long, and record all the birds for one specific location. Okay, so then you're recording breeding evidence. So what's involved with that? So there's sort of four levels of breeding evidence, and the first one is really no breeding evidence at all. It's that you've seen a bird in its breeding season, but there's no real evidence of breeding. So herons, we know, nest in colonies. So if this bird is just feeding away along the side of a river, um, that bird isn't giving any indication that it's nesting in that, in that site. So it's just recorded with an X. And so you'll have a data form with you, or you can actually use your notebook, or you can use the app in the field, and I'll talk a bit more about that. But you just record for that bird the X, a simple X, indicating yes, it's there, but no indication of nesting. And then the next level up is for what we call possible breeders. So if you have a bird that's there, it's in its breeding season, in its nesting habitat, you could record an H indicating habitat that it's a possible breeder in that square on that on that visit. And at a slightly higher level of evidence is if you have a singing bird uh, present, again, it's in suitable nesting habitat in its breeding season. That's a possible breeder. And um, this is the way, obviously, that most of the birds get, get reported at first. 
And so there's like this yellow throat, um, this, the perula singing away there, or the pipe bill grebe in suitable habitat in their nesting season, they'd all be possible breeders. I put the H at the top there, but because the, uh, the perula is singing, that would actually be, be an S. Okay, then probable, there are a whole bunch of codes, and I won't, won't get into all of these, but a number of codes that indicate the bird is probably breeding. And I should mention these codes are sort of internationally approved. They, these are used around the world, usually slightly tweaked between different projects, but the, the basic set, the basic principle has been used right around the world now since about 1970. Um, one of the new codes for the Ontario Atlas that's used widely in the United States is this um, at least seven singing birds. Um, they might also be producing sounds such as drumming or winnowing if they're a snipe, um, heard in the square on the same visit to the square. So basically that bird, you're in there in the nesting season, in suitable habitat for these birds, and there's obviously lots of them. So I think it's fair enough to say those are probable breeders. That species is a probable breeder in the square. If you come across a pair of birds, again, suitable habitat, suitable um, in the nesting season, you can record a pair. If you go back to that same location and that Perula ward was singing again in the same spot, that would indicate it's got a permanent territory there, and that would, again, be probable breeder. There are a number of other codes here. I won't, I won't go down all the way through them all, um, but right through to uh, nest building, um, where it's nest building for birds like wrens and woodpeckers, which for which uh, when a woodpecker knocks a hole in a tree, it might be for a roost, it might be for other purposes, and so it's not necessarily uh, nesting, but it's probably nesting somewhere in that in that vicinity. Again, assuming that we're talking about the breeding season and the breeding habitat for that bird. So just back to our, our graphic here. So the singing perula has been there for over a week, and that bird could be considered now a probable breeder. A pair of uh, sandhill cranes like these would indicate um, would indicate probable breeding for the square for the uh, crane in that square. Confirm breeding now. Now we're getting up. The idea is that you're trying to work towards getting as many of these uh, records confirmed as possible. And so nest building for any species other than wrens and woodpeckers is considered confirmed breeding, as is things like distraction displays. If a killdeer is doing a nice distraction display for you, saves you having to find a nest or find any young, you can count that as a confirmed breeder. Um, old nests, I, I'm, <laughs> uh, one of the things you can do is go around in the wintertime and look for old oriole nests and um, indicate and show that, yes, indeed, the oriole did nest in that square in the, uh, in the previous year. We won't be able to use that this first winter, of course, because there will be uh, nests from the previous uh, year. But um, that is a tactic that, uh, that we can use. If, you're, if you can't find an oriole during the nesting season, you can probably find the nest in the, in the winter. Of course, recently fledged young for birds that are incapable of flight um, would be considered confirmed breeding. Um, this code, adult entering, is really just a bird on a nest. Um, or you see a bird going in and out of a hole frequently. Um, that would indicate the bird's nesting there. Um, if you see birds carrying food, um, often in the nesting season, they, they've got a big mouthful of insects or worms. That uh, good indication that the birds are nesting there, and that would confirm breeding. And obviously, nests and nests with eggs or young would also confirm breeding. So obviously, uh, in the case of this sandhill crane, this, this bird obviously nested in the location. Um, you can see the, uh, the newly fledged young there. And the, the same with the pied bill grebe and this, the nest of yellow warblers. Um, can't get much better evidence for nesting than that. So I mentioned the app earlier. Uh, this app still in development, but um, is functioning. We used it this last breeding season and um, it's continuing to improve and we'll, we'll have it fully launched by the time the project starts in, uh, in January. And as you go onto the app, you have a choice. You can choose general atlasing or point counts. And again, I'll go into the point counts a little bit later. But really, it's a lot like eBird. Um, what, what, maybe I'll, before I go on, I'll mention that the uh, um, you can record the track here. And our hope is that most checklists will come in with a track on it. So that the, the uh, phone basically tracks you and the, uh, 
the track showing where you visited in the square will be attached to this particular checklist. And so when you uh, open up the data, you get a, a, a list here of the species that, um, and the, the list will be selected for the species that are most likely to be in your area to narrow it down and make it easier for you to find them. And you'll notice it's very simple for you to enter the breeding evidence there. So you just use those two letter, one letter, two letter codes that uh, we had earlier. In this case, uh, the person had a nest with young for wood ducks. I guess they must have just been hatching. And um, they had a count of three wood ducks on this particular checklist. And so there's a whole list of probably 150 birds on there that you might, that you might, uh, you might find in the square. And then this all goes in in your checklist, much much as it does in eBird. I should mention, as I did earlier, I think you can just uh, keep track of things in your notebook if you prefer to do that, or you can use a standard data form. They'll be uh, downloadable right off the off the website. And then if you enter, if you um, report record data that way, then you're going to have to sit at the computer and enter the data yourself at the end of the day. Um, and we'd encourage you to get those data in as quickly as you can. Um, each year we, we try and have all the data in by, by the end of, uh, end of September. But obviously it's much better if you can go right into the square, into the uh, database when you get home and enter the data. It will go live right into the, uh, into the system and people will be able to see what has been and hasn't been reported in your in your square or the square you're working on on that day. Okay, so back to the, um, the, the map of the square. On each of these maps um, are 50 randomly located point counts, point count locations. And um, the point counts, it really, it, it's the, about the simplest form of bird survey you can do. It's a matter of standing in one spot for, in the case of the Atlas, we use five minute point counts and you record all the birds that you can hear and see in that five minute period. And the goal for the Atlas, um, we're still tweaking the goals, but it looks like the goal this time is going to be to record data at 20 of these locations on the road, and then an additional five points that are off road. And for each square, the actual um, habitat that we want you to sample in the square is going to be listed. So you see the yellow bar across here at the bottom. So 20 roadside points, but we also want you to find off-road locations somewhere in that square where you can do point counts, two point counts in deciduous forest, one in a coniferous forest, one in a mix, and one in a, a pasture or grassland. Now, obviously, um, Point counts are intended for experienced birders. You really have to know your birds well by um, hearing and by sight to do a point count properly. And so we really encourage you, if you have that skill set, to uh, sign up and for the project and get involved in, in doing point counts. Um, certainly, we'll be encouraging people to do point counts in their own squares. And if you have the skill set, we're going to be encouraging you to do point counts in, in various squares, helping out people who may not have have those skills in, in other squares around you. And we uh, the app, we're still playing with the app, but it looks as though um, one of the things we can do this time is actually zoom right in on a location like this. So your app will have a small map like this, and you'll be able to put right on the, uh, right on the map the actual location where you got each one of those birds in your, in your five minute point count. And use the four letter codes, obviously, to save space and make it quick to enter the data. And you can tell us uh, the, the distance and direction that they were from you. Um, and obviously, that is um, extremely useful data for all kinds of different purposes. So we'll use it uh, immediately to map the relative abundance of the birds of the province. All of the data will be will be accumulated and we'll be able to see how the numbers of horned larks and red-winged blackbirds change across the province. And, and then has just numerous other applications. You can see here how we'll be able to relate birds to habitats in, in a much more precise way than we've been able to in, in previous atlases. Okay, so what's our targets then? Um, if you look at the, the bottom three layers, the southern Ontario here, the dark green, mid green, and the sort of turquoisey green there at the bottom, those three areas make up southern Ontario, and our goal is to get the 2,000 squares in that area adequately covered. And adequate coverage is at least 20 hours 
of data collection during the peak of the breeding season, basically from late May through early July, and um, 25 <coughs> point counts in a whole bunch of those squares. So more precisely, in the dark area around the um, around the Lake Ontario, sort of the Golden Horseshoe area there, we're hoping to get point counts done in every square. Um, in the area outside of that, south of the Shield, we're looking for about half the squares. And in the rest of the area in Southern Ontario, about 25% of the squares that we'd like to get point counts. And I should say at this point, that's not set in stone. We may be tweaking that a little bit as we get closer to the start of the project. Further north though, um, our goals have to be much less ambitious. Obviously, it's huge um, up there and very little access to the far northern area. So our goals, are, um, which are basically the same, these are the, these are the goals that we laid out in Atlas 2. And at this point, they're pretty much the same for Atlas 3. And that is, we want to get about 5% of the squares in the sort of main part of the boreal forest there, the central part of the province. Um, five squares in each 100 kilometer block adequately covered. And then in the far north, where access is extremely difficult and, uh, and challenging, uh, we're looking for 2%. So if we can get into two squares in each of the 100 kilometer blocks in the north, um, we'll, be, we'll be very, very happy uh, to get that done. And that will give us a, as thorough a picture as we think is, um, is possible on uh, in, uh, uh, in in the five years of the project. Okay, so uh, hopefully you've seen the Atlas book. There's some um, uh, samples from it on the website. You can have a look at um, the book. I should mention is still for sale. It, it's a it's a big book, 700 pages, and just a goldmine of information about the birds in the province. If you don't yet have a copy, there's uh, still a number of books available. So um, please go ahead and order, order yourself one while there still are some left. Uh, so starting at the bottom left here, the, the, the key thing, and, and this is what started with Atlas One, was collecting data on the, the uh, distribution of the species. So which squares did, in this case, the barn swallow occur in? And you can see all those red squares. That's where it was confirmed, where nesting was confirmed. There's sort of a, a mid-orange square, and those are where probable breeding, and there's a few light um, orange squares where only possible breeding was found. When we did this, at, when we did the, uh, produce this map for the second atlas, we went back and we were looking, we were able to compare to the first atlas. So the black dots on this map are the squares in which the species was reported in Atlas 1, but wasn't reported in Atlas 2. So you can see there a real pattern to it, where the bird has, has dropped in numbers in the, the central part of the province there quite, quite noticeably. A lot, of, a lot of squares that had it previously uh, don't have it anymore. You can also see the distribution uh, where it occurs right across the province, mostly obviously in the developed south, but it does occur in few of the uh, indigenous communities in the in remote northern Ontario. Now, if you jump up to the top right of the screen and you can see this is the map that results from the point counts where we get a count of the number of birds um, in, on each of those points. And you can see there a lot more detail as to where the bird is abundant. You can see it's obviously in highest numbers down in the southwestern Ontario and uh, small pockets elsewhere with uh, with good numbers. But the numbers on the shield are much lower. And um, that obviously reflects the, the decline uh, right through the north where it, it, it gets thinner and thinner as you, as you go further north. I'll just catch up with myself here and uh, show some of these. So we were tremendously successful last time. The birders of the province put in an amazing 68,000 point counts um, over the five years of the project. And we can, we're can we hoping we can do that well or better this time um, based on that 25 points per square. We were the first atlas in North America to do this. And um, we would be the first to be uh, doing the second, but one of the U.S. atlases is jumping ahead and only doing a 15-year cycle on their project, so they may be ahead of us at the end. But anyway, uh, it's going to put us at, right at the leading edge of our, the knowledge of our birds in the province. Really, no other jurisdiction in North America is going to know its birds as well as we do uh, when we're done collecting data for this project. 
And uh, obviously, it gives us the ability to compare now. Because we did point counts in Atlas two. we can compare back and look at how those this, um, this more detailed pattern of distribution uh, and abundance of the bird has changed over that 20 years, which is obviously going to be invaluable. We can look at how the changes that we're seeing in these patterns are reflected in the landscapes and the habitats um, and, the, and the weather and the climate. Um, in, in that part of the province. Should be ex extremely useful for understanding some of the processes behind these changing populations. Now, in the middle there is a little histogram, which is hard to read on the screen, I know, but um, it, this allows us to um, look, to break down the province into eco-regions and look from south to north as to the likelihood of the bird being found in each one of the 10 kilometer squares within that region and compare those over time. So statistically, we can compare, this is basically the, the data from the map at the bottom left um, in a form that you can, you can do comparisons over time. And of course, in the third atlas, we're gonna be able to compare right back to the two previous atlases. An innovation in atlas three is that we're gonna be able to map that information. So. We can get point count maps for probably about a third of the species, but we can get these what's called probability of observation maps, which are similar to point count maps, but, but not in the same detail, um, for probably another 30 or 40 percent. So we'll probably end up with about two thirds of the species that we'll be able to map the relative abundance of as well as the, as well as the distribution. So really a great step forward. Um, I, just in terms of the book, the book, um, if you haven't had a chance to see it, a, an expert writes these accounts and, and does an interpretation of the maps, explains the maps, explains the patterns of change and occurrence over time, and uh, says a little bit about the breeding biology and then some information on the abundance of the birds and, and how it has changed over time. Like I said, we're still not quite sure about the book, but um, looking for some feedback on that. So I just picked a couple here just to show some examples uh, from the book, but uh, the Wilson snipe, you can see obviously a bird very thinly distributed down in the southwestern part of the province. Most of the wetlands have been drained in that area, very little habitat left for them. But you can still see quite widely distributed right across southern Ontario, if you look at that map at the bottom left. If you go up to the top right, you can see the pattern of, of abundance of the bird. And there's a couple of interesting patterns there. Um, if, up in Gray County there, you see that the dark blob there. Unfortunately, I don't have a pointer. I can't point at it. But um, in the southwestern part of the province, the dark blob there, that's, that's right around what's called Proton Township. I don't know if anybody knows about Proton, but the locals call it Floatin, Floatin Proton because it gets so much rain. And um, the Grand River and the Nottawasaga and the uh, so various branches of the Saugeen start in this township. It's the wettest, soggiest place around, and it's wonderful for wetland birds. So um, things like snipe show up in good numbers in there. You can also see it's got high level of abundance in eastern Ontario. But if you see the small map at the top right there, you can see, although the numbers might be higher in eastern Ontario and in Float and Proton, those numbers are nothing compared to the numbers along the Hudson Bay coast, where the species is, is far more abundant. Um, Tennessee Warbler, just to show you what the maps look like for one of the species that's widely distributed in the north, you can see that we've, we, you can see the map there in the top right showing the, the squares that we were able to get to in Atlas II and the uh, breeding evidence for the bird. And then the small inset map is the uh, relative abundance across the province. So you can see, again, another species, uh, that this one's a boreal warbler, much higher numbers up in the northern part of the boreal forest than uh, down in the south. And you can see also in the map in the bottom left, quite a drop off in the numbers of Tennessee warblers um, between atlases. They're known to be a, a budworm species, so it's quite possible their numbers might be starting to turn around as the budworm is increasing here and there across uh, eastern North America. So we might we might show some different results this time for the for the Tennessee warbler. It'll be interesting to see. So just in terms of overall coverage last time, we had about uh, 1,900 primary atlases, we called them at the time, which are basically people who took on responsibility for a square, and there are a whole bunch of people, uh, assistants that helped them. 
that worked with them and um, provided data perhaps to them, but we only ended up with 1,900 people, uh, names specifically associated with data points. Um, this time, things won't be done in quite the same way, but um, anyway, we ended up with around 3,400 people participating, uh, contributing data one way or another to the project. And you can see back in the first project, um, much less than that, we had much better turnout in Atlas II, and we're hoping we can get the uh, another another increase in the number of, of uh, participants this time around. Um, we logged an awful lot of effort in Atlas II, 150,000 hours. We got data in for about 5,000 squares. There are about 10,000 squares in the province overall, and so, but still a huge effort and uh, we we're very pleased with that. As I said, 68,000 point counts. We did report breeding evidence for um, 286 species during Atlas II. There have been over 300 species actually reported a nesting in the province, but um, some of them are gone now and, and others are, are changing distribution over time. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of the last atlas, uh, and the first one was big for this, we, we found several new breeding species in the first atlas. In the second one, um, nailed down a couple of species that weren't known to, uh, to nest previously. And it's kind of shocking now to look back and think that trumpeter swan, that was a new breeding species 20 years ago in the province. The, the, um, was documented for the first time, as was the, the black neck stilt, which is illustrated here. Um, we're hoping that the black neck still will come back and we'll, um, we might get uh, another of those nesting, nesting this time around. We also find nests for five of these northern species that it, whose nests had never been found in the province before during Atlas II. And it, obviously that was a result of an expanded effort in the north in Atlas II. Again, something we're hoping we can build on this time around. One of the key things that comes out of the Atlas, of course, is records of uh, rare species, and we more than 10,000 sites were documented for rare species across the province. So um, that's obviously just a goldmine of information on the locations of the birds, what their nesting evidence was, how many of them there were at, the, at uh, particular locations. That's really valuable for a lot of different purposes. Um, just in terms of a few highlights, th this blue graph here shows the um, the, the increase in the number of squares between atlases. So you can see the big winner there, the Canada goose, um, over a thousand squares that it was reported in in Atlas II that it wasn't reported in in Atlas I. Um, some others you can see there, quite surprising, um, things like blue-headed vireo, uh, vastly increased in abundance between the two atlas projects, turkey vultures expanding their range, um, wild turkey, um, obviously increasing and increasing, lots of different ones there, particularly a, lot, a large number of big birds in there, um, bald eagles, sandhill cranes, and the, and the goose and the turkey and the turkey vulture, some of the biggest birds in the province, but expanding their numbers. Just to give you a few examples of what that looks like in map form, so you can see the odd dot in here, the odd square that doesn't have a dot in it, and those are the squares that the turkey was in during Atlas One. So down around Long Point, there are a few. Over in Northumberland County, there are a few, a few, a few north of Toronto. But the reintroduction program was really just getting started at that point. The yellow dots are all squares that the species was reported in in Atlas II, but it wasn't reported in Atlas I. And you can see just a huge expansion in the uh, occurrence of the bird over that time. And I would imagine the, uh, the expansion will have continued and will, will fill in it almost all those squares on Atlas III. Um, sandhill crane, uh, um, you're, if you're a birder, you've probably seen a lot more sandhill cranes than you used to. Again, if you look up around Sault Ste. Marie, you can see squares there where the bird was reported nesting in the first atlas, but a huge change happened after Atlas I. Um, I guess you can see one or two spots on the tip of the Bruce Peninsula where the bird had just started to expand into, uh, into Southern Ontario. And by the end of the atlas, you can see it was quite widespread. Again, I'm expecting a huge um, expansion on this in Atlas Three. Then there's a whole suite of species that are expanding up from the south, probably related to climate change. But uh, Carolina wren here, all these yellow dots are, are new squares. But when you think of red-bellied woodpecker, perhaps um, tufted titmouse, um, 
blue-gray gnatcatcher, a lot of those very southern, what we used to call them Carolinian species, but a lot of them now are expanding up much beyond the Carolinian. Um, the, this third atlas is going to give us a really clear picture of, of how much of that is happening in the province. Okay, on the flip side, there's the species that have shown decline over time. You can see the big loser there was Nighthawk going, uh, seen in 545 less squares in Atlas 2 than it was in Atlas 1. And you got to keep in mind that we got much better coverage in Atlas 2 than Atlas 1. So uh, a huge decline. And it's representative of that suite of birds co we're calling the aerial insectivores. They catch insects on the wing. And uh, a number of them are represented here. They've shown a large decline. Um, and the atlas was really the first, in, uh, first source of information in uh, Canada to bring forward this pattern. And it's resulted in an awful lot of effort going into trying to figure out why the uh, aerial insectivores are declining. But you can see here the bank swallow, the barn swallow, the chimney swift, the cliff swallow, um, whippoorwill, all aerial insectivores in much decline. Another group of birds that decline markedly are the grassland birds. So things like uh, cowbird, vesper, sparrow, um, some of the other ones that are just off the bottom of the graph here decline quite a lot between the two atlases. So upland sandpiper is one of the representatives, the grassland birds, really a big decline between the two. Again, I'm expecting there'll be um, continuing decline of this species. Um, they're getting in hard, harder and harder to find in, in our part of the world. Loggerhead shrike was a rare bird in the, uh, in the first atlas, but by the second atlas, it had dwindled down to just, a, you know, I think there were about 50 pairs in atlas two, scattered across a, a few squares. And the situation probably has continued to decline somewhat um, for this bird um, right on the edge, just hanging on in the province. And then there's the Nighthawk map. You can see that uh, it doesn't show the whole province, but a big declines in the north as well, um, at least in parts of the north, other, other areas actually, the, the, the uh, Nighthawk seems to be doing quite well. But in the south here, where most of the coverage was, and we have a lot of squares covered, you can see quite a pattern of decline extensively for that bird, for those black dots. Okay, so um, if, you, if you've been to a presentation about the atlas before, you know about this, but if you've never thought about what the commonest birds in the province are, the atlas gave us a great handle on this, the best handle we've ever had, because we cover the whole province. So I'm just going to run quickly through um, what these might be. And everyone always says Canada Goose was the first one. But anyway, I'll just I'll zip through and we'll build here to seeing um, how common some of these birds are. These are estimated numbers of birds in the province. We'll just keep going down and down. Some familiar birds, but then, you know, some that aren't quite as, as familiar. Some that are um, like the robin, I guess, isn't much of a surprise. But then we start getting into these birds, the really common ones. And they're birds that we, a lot of them, we only see on migration on the way through or they're down in the winter time. We don't see huge numbers of them. Um, and that's because they nest up in the boreal forest. And the big winner here turned out to be the Nashville warbler, which surprised almost everybody. Um, when we pulled the data in from the point counts right across the province, the most abundant bird was the Nashville warbler. So it'll be fascinating to see if it's still true. And we've got more sophisticated analyses now. We can build more... Um, uh, more factors into our analyses when we model the, the um, distribution and abundance of these birds. So we might get some changes around in numbers and obviously changes might be occurring with, with all of the changes in the environment. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out as most common this time. Okay, so what's different about atlasing? If you haven't ever tried it, I just want to run, it, run through a few things that make it different and make it kind of exciting. Um, you're, you're challenged with trying to find all the species in a square. Now, most of those squares in southern Ontario have probably close to 100 species in them. And so um, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of knowledge, a lot of skill to find all those birds. And um, it's, of course, an, a fun and interesting process filling in that checklist, um, filling up uh, the checklist as you go. Working in a square like this, birders tend to go to the same old places all the time to see birds. The atlas forces you out of that and gets you into places you've never been before. And often you find fascinating little places around the square that have got cool species in. You had no idea we're, we're nesting locally. So it's really good and interesting for that. 
searching out breeding evidence is really interesting. You learn a lot more about the birds, you learn about their relations to their habitats, and um, adds a lot to your knowledge. Um, the great thing, the thing I love most about the Atlas is that we're all working together on this with a common purpose. You know, the harder I work on it, the more valuable it makes your results and, and vice versa. The, the, we're supporting each other, we're helping get all of this work done and filling in the coverage and providing a great database for, uh, for scientific and conservation purposes. There is a role for every birder and um, we're hoping everyone who's involved on the talk today will, will sign up and, uh, and, and get involved. I'll talk a little bit more about the various roles. And of course, um, I, I said, it says remote work here. We have the north to cover. And so if you've, uh, if you've been to the north, north before, you know how amazing it is up there. If you haven't been, um, really encourage you to get up there. Uh, we're, we run trips. We do a lot of canoe trips go down most of the major rivers in the north. If you've got the wilderness survival skills, you've got the canoeing skills, and you've got the birding skills, um, you, there's a place for you on some of these on these trips. So um, we'll be promoting that and uh, getting people signed up over the over the coming months. Of course, you don't have to drive around your square. You can hike around it. You can bike around it. You're canoeing and kayaking, all the ways of uh, getting around in your square, getting into the different habitats. It's a great way to, uh, to learn all about your local area and uh, enjoy the process. And of course, uh, uh, below it all is the fact that, this, that what you're doing is collecting data. You might be out there having fun kayaking and birding at the same time, but you're collecting data that's useful for conservation and, and research purposes. Okay, so roles for atlasers. There's a lot of different ways that you can take part in the project. If you're a knowledgeable birder and you can identify uh, most of the birds that are likely to occur in a square, then you can get signed on as a principal atlaser. Basically, you take overall responsibility for ensuring that square is covered. We're very flexible, though. Anybody can collect data in any square. It's just you're taking on the responsibility of ensuring a particular square gets gets covered. And um, in a lot of places where birding, uh, there's not a lot of birders, you'll probably have the square largely to yourself and uh, can uh, try and meet the challenge of finding all those birds yourself. If you know your birds well by song, you can do those point counts that I uh, talked about earlier. Um, anybody can do checklists anywhere, so you don't. The fact that we have principal atlas for, for squares doesn't mean that uh, anyone can collect data anywhere they want to. It's much like eBird in that regard. The difference being, you've got to make sure you're not crossing square boundaries. Your checklists have to be particular to a square, and um, the atlas has the, the information and the maps to help make that uh, make that feasible for you. We're asking this time for experienced birders to be helping to mentor new birders. We want the birding community to, to improve their skill levels. The more knowledgeable birders we have out there, the more useful it is for collecting data for projects like the Atlas. And so um, if you um, need some help with this, then contact your regional coordinator and um, we can start this process of mentoring. We, we, um, I, this is new and we haven't really got it rolling yet, but it is going to be something we're rolling out over the coming months. You can do special surveys. As we go down here, you need less and less uh, knowledge or expertise to uh, participate. So um, for owl, to do owl surveys, if you're going to do out and do a screech owl survey, uh, you really don't only need to know a handful of birds, um, some of the owls that you're likely to hear on a nocturnal survey out there. Same with night jars, it's just a couple of species that you need to uh, to know the calls of. And marsh birds, again, slightly more specialized. There's a, a larger suite of birds, but you don't have to know everything to do some of these, uh, these key projects. And in the case of the owls, if you're doing a screech owl survey, you're playing a screech owl tape or recording and so you're going to be very familiar with the call of a screech owl by the time you're you you're done that, that project. Um, now, incidental observations. Anybody basically can submit incidental observations to the project. If you know what a Canada goose is, and that's the only bird you know, um, you're welcome to to um, enter that data into the database and put a dot on the map for a Canada goose. Um, there are going to be group activities in each region. If we find squares that need need help, we're going to have organized activities to um, we'll get together. Often, we used to do it in our area on a Wednesday evening. Uh, a group of people would get together and we'd go and, and target some squares. We called it square bashing, 
we'd go up and target some squares that needed work. And we're looking there, it's a good place uh, to mix um, newer and more experienced birders. Of course, with COVID, we're going to have to work out some of those things this time around. But um, we'll be doing those both in the regional, local level, and we're going to be doing it at provincial level. So we're going to have these events in Algonquin Park and probably along the French River and other places in central Ontario that are hard to get to, that have a lot of squares that need coverage. We're going to be having events where people can go up and camp and uh, spend a few days and uh, collect data in these really fascinating parts of the province. ARUs, I'm going to come back to. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about those. Excuse me. Um, if you take bird photographs, we're really interested in getting them just to help illustrate um, the website and some of our activities. Um, <laughs> this is a bit of a long shot, but if you um, are have expertise in French in particular, all of our materials we want translated. There's times when we have to get stuff translated and uh, the regular channels that we use aren't available. So if you have expertise and could help us with that, um, please let us know at the office. And then uh, um, if you do have any insights, we're, we're always looking for ways. We have to try and get into all these spots in northern Ontario. If you have ideas on how to do that, you have connections with people who are working or active in the north who have businesses in the north that could help us, then please let us know about that kind of thing. There's lots of ways of, uh, of contributing, contributing data and contributing to the project. Okay, so I mentioned the ARUs, these uh, autonomous recording units. Um, as a birder, you can stand there and figure it out for yourself, or we can you can use these autonomous recording units. Now, these are going to be a big part of Atlas Three, probably not for most of us, for the atlasers in the field. Um, but in northern Ontario, these are going to be huge. Um, we're going to try and repeat our effort from Atlas Two and get all of those rivers done and get into as many remote areas as we can. But there are so many areas; it's so vast that. Um, having a network of these listening devices scattered across the north in a systematic way that uh, gives us better coverage of habitats that are otherwise difficult to get to and locations that are difficult to get to is, is going to be invaluable. And so um, working with different government organizations, the Wildlife Service and the Nature of Natural Resources and others, the parks are, are uh, getting involved in this, are going to be putting out these devices um, programming them to listen at certain times of day, certain times of the month, and um, going back and retrieving the devices, downloading it, and then having people listen in to these, or for some species, you can actually run them through the computer and it will tell you if the bird's there or not and um, identify it when it's calling. Um, it's just going to be a goldmine of information to complement the work that the atlasers are doing. And again, the focus is on places that the atlasers can't get to. So a lot of this work will be by helicopter and, um, and other ways of getting into, into these most remote locations. There are now handheld autonomous recording units like this. And so it's possible, and we're working on this, that even if you don't know your birds well enough to do point counts yourself, if you're in an area where there aren't many birders, you could go and stand for five minutes at these 25 different locations, record the birds on these devices. Those can go in, expert can listen to them and interpret them, and that data will go into the project along with the rest. So again, that's how you could be involved in, in using these ARUs. I um, haven't talked much about all the applications of the ATLAS data. Of course, we've said how good it is for scientific purposes and conservation purposes, but just a few of the applications are listed here. For the species at risk, you can see a lot, a lot of different applications. COSIWIC, which is the committee that designates species as at risk in Canada, um, the, the ATLAS is, is a goldmine of information. It's really valuable information for developing the recovery strategies and action plans for those birds. Each of them requires, if it's a species at risk, we have to identify critical habitat. And so that you can, as you can tell, the kind of data we're collecting for the atlas would be really useful. It tells us about the characteristics of the habitat, and it also tells us precisely where they are so that we can map the critical habitat for these birds using the atlas data. Um, and then we've got population and distribution objectives at, at helping us to set that. And if we're going to go out and survey for these species, the atlas gives us a really great source of information to uh, to be helping get those designs going. 
I just looked at the clock and realized I'm running awfully late. So there's numerous applications here, all wonderful, and I, I better skip on, I'm afraid. I'm so sorry I've gone on so quickly. Anyway, just to mention that if you're an eBirder, you can get your data into the Atlas. Um, uh, your data can go uh, from eBird into the Atlas, or if you submit data to the Atlas, that data can go into eBird, and um, really, uh, we're hoping that's fairly seamless. If you're entering it the other way and you want to enter a data in eBird and put it in the Atlas, there's some steps, extra steps you're going to have to have to go through. We're certainly encouraging people to use the Atlas app. Um, we are working with the parks folks to get us access to parks where we can um, we can focus special efforts. And uh, I won't say too much more about that, but we'll be explaining more as time goes on. I encourage you to go and have a look at the website. You can uh, look at learning resources, for example, on there. And we're talking uh, Dendroica in particular here is especially useful tool. Um, allows you to look at different pictures of the birds to listen to numerous. Um, recordings of the species and um, really uh, bone up over the winter time. Really encourage you to, if you haven't um, worked on your birds before, really focus on and use Dendroica as a way of enhancing your skills. Um, encourage you to go on and register on the website. It's all up and running as of a few hours ago and uh, hopefully that all goes smoothly. So Folks, um, you can see these folks. These are all pictures from Atlas II up in up on the Hudson Bay lowlands and on the northern rivers and on their bikes and, and remote beaches and all these wonderful places around the province that they can go out and collect data and uh, really encourage you to become, become part of this team. Um, we have done it twice. We want to do it, uh, do it again, and even better this time if we can. Encourage you to, to get involved. So it's only a couple of months away from when you can start collecting data. The um, project, uh, I should say, great horned owls start uh, are singing probably very soon, and they'll be singing on January first. And you can start recording uh, recording those because that is part of their breeding season. The horned larks will start arriving in uh, in February and um, starting to establish territories, and a few of those will be able to start recording as early as probably the end of February or into March. So just leave you with this information on um, various ways of contacting us, various ways of keeping up with, uh, with what the Atlas is up to. And I just wanna say thank you very much for your time. I'm afraid I do apologize for going on longer than I should have. Um, but I'm hoping we can go on a bit over time if people do have questions that we can help you with. So can I hand that back to you, Sarah? Yes, I am here. I'm just going to make sure I can be seen again. Uh, maybe we can get you to go out of full screen on your computer, Mike. Go out of it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. We'll go back into gallery view. Hi, everyone. Welcome. All right, so if anybody has any questions, um, type them into the chat box. Uh, we've been answering questions as, you, as you've been going along. Um, if something didn't get answered adequately, please type it in there and let us know. Um, and if we aren't able to answer a question for you, we will definitely get you to the right place to get that answer. So I'm just going to turn it over to you folks. Uh, we're getting lots of applause and thank yous, Mike, on our on our chat. So, and yep, it was a great presentation. Makes me excited about getting out there and and recording wild turkey for Point Peely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have a question from Josh. What is a good skill level to take responsibility as a principal atlaser? Well, you would, I think. Mm, preferably know the birds that are likely to occur in your square by sight and I think the majority to know, know them by sound would be good. It, it really depends. If you're in Toronto where there's probably going to be dozens of people per square, I think it, probably the principal atlas would be someone who knows all the birds very well. If you're away from that area, um, that we're going to be even say in the Guelph area, by the time you get 50 miles from Guelph, there's not a lot of birders out there, and we're going to be looking for people with a wide range of skills to, to fill in them. So um, for principal atlases, though, you really need to know the birds quite well. Um, and I just have a follow-up here um, from Linda. 
how will um, it be decided who the principal atlasers will be? That, uh, that's, yeah, that gets worked out by, with your regional coordinator. The okay. coordinators will be assigning those. Um, we, and uh, uh, even if there's a principal atlaser, uh, one of our regional coordinators the other day was saying, I've got six people all living in the same square. They all want to be the same square, which is fine. And everybody's quite welcome to submit data for the square. Um, one of them, I guess, will get identified as the principal atlaser, but yeah. they're all quite able to participate. Okay. Um, someone asked, is there an issue when you actually start? So I guess um, this is probably brought on by the, we can start in January. Um, this mm -hmm. person wouldn't be available to the end of May or June. That's the perfect time to get involved, right, Mike? Yeah, the project's five years long and you're not expected, we're not expecting people to start on day one and stay for the whole five years. It's really going to be up to you how long you stay with it. We're hoping, obviously you'll get started and you'll want to do more and more each year. But um, yeah, if you can't get going in year one, great, start in year two. Okay. It's, uh, it's very flexible that way. All right, we have another question here. Um, is there going to be a team of people or somebody contacting cities so that we can survey sewage lagoons? There actually is. We just formed a small group and we started to pull the paperwork together and are working out ways to do that. It's probably gonna be done in concert with our regional coordinators, but yes. It is, it's a priority to get done. Okay, so um, somebody is asking, how do you find out who is responsible for a square? That's where you'd go to the website, right, Mike? <laughs> well, you go to the regional coordinator. Um, yeah, the, the regional coordinator will be able to give you that information. Now, they're only just starting to assign people to square, so it's going to, it's 99% holes at this point, but... Um, the regional coordinator has their own mapping system and tracking for that. So they will know who is uh, responsible for covering each square. Okay. Um, I also have a question is, do you need to register on the website to be able to participate in the Atlas? Yes. So that was an easy yes <laughs> answer. Um, and then somebody else is wanting to know approximate time commitment do you have to do to do a square properly? Do I have to quit my day job? And there's there's a winky face with that. So I think they're telling you that they'd like you to say that. Um, right. And they appreciate that it will vary by landscape. Yeah, by location. And yeah, some, if you're down in southwest, the very southwest, Essex and Kent, where there's not a great diversity of habitat outside of Point Pelee and a couple other places, your square probably doesn't take as long to do. We're still looking for 20 hours of effort uh, as a minimum. Uh, we did find in Atlas 2 in southern Ontario, we averaged over 50 hours per square anyway. So we, we sort of well exceeded the uh, the minimum minimum requirement of 20 hours. And our hope is we'll get that 20 hours, mostly in the peak of the breeding season. But we also, obviously, we want people out um, looking for owls and other things that nest earlier in the season. And uh, certainly through the, the through the spring, when some of the early nesting birds, like thinking of rough grouse and things that are drumming away in April, that uh, it, it's good to be spending time in your square at that time too. Okay. Uh, so we have somebody who's asking, um, it sounds like they've already signed up and they're wondering if they should have been contacted already by the regional coordinator. I think we're, they're probably just starting to contact people, right? Yeah. It, well, literally it, it just opened up in the last few hours and I'm sure it's going to take a while because quite possibly we're hoping a lot of people um, starting to sign on. And the regional coordinators, they're, they're all, they all have their own style and approach. But um, as long as there was a regional coordinator for your area, somebody will be back in touch with you soon. Um, I have somebody who says they are interested in helping, but I might know only two-thirds of the call. How do I participate? That's fine. Um, one thing I would suggest is just try and work on the rest over the winter as much as you can. Work with other birders and enhance your skill set. But really, um, knowing a lot of songs, you can go out and uh, do a lot of useful work in the project. Obviously, you know most of the birds, and um, that in itself is extremely useful. So I would encourage you to encourage you to get involved. And you know, it is a limited suite of species in each square, a limited species uh, list that you're likely to come across. So you can focus in. There's information on the website as to which species nested in that square last time. So you can focus your efforts on learning more about uh, which species to expect. Yeah. And also, too, when you're hearing things and, you you know, you hear something and you know, I don't know what it is, but you know it's different from the other stuff. You might be able to track down what it is and learn some new bird song while you're at it, too, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, somebody is asking, um, does a person who can recognize most birds by sight but not by sound because of hearing difficulties be considered a principal atlaser? Yeah, certainly. Um, it certainly would be feasible, yes. Um, it, it, it's going to depend a little bit on the location that you're in. If there's a, a load of great birders that, uh, that can do um, birding by uh, sight and, and by sound, um, they'll probably get somewhat of a priority for the regional coordinator because we have to get point counts done and such. But in, in most cases, I think it should be quite feasible. Um, we have a question here about how, do, how are we going to ensure that breeding locations for species at risk are not inadvertently posted on eBird? <laughs> well, eBird, we, we can't do anything about eBird, unfortunately. Um, the, we, we, we have a group that our significant species committee has is going to have rules on this, and species uh, will be flagged if they're of interest and you're gonna be asked to document them when, when you uh, report them. And that will go through a whole process. Those won't be, be made public until they've, uh, until they've been approved. So um, that, that's a certain amount of screening. And then if the species that we're particularly concerned about, and we will be coming up with a list of those, um, those records will be shielded in, in probably from everybody. Excellent. Okay, uh, somebody is saying that they have uh, family in Thunder Bay. How often would they need to go up north to be in order to be helpful there? The more the better, but yeah, a single visit is, is great. It, it, a good way of uh, you know, finding some gaps and you, you'll be able to see on the website as things are filling in which areas have been covered and which haven't. And um, yeah, a single visit is, is more than adequate. Most of those trips that we do to Northern Ontario are just going to be a single visit to a square. Okay, and we have another question here. What do you hope the Ontario Parks role will be in this program? Well, Ontario Parks is, has been great. They're... Um, I didn't mention them up front. They're not one of the formal sponsors of the project, but they're involved in all of our committees. We're working with them. Um, I had that site I had to zip through, but it did. We are working with them to work out ways that um, the atlasers who are designated to cover squares in parks will be able to uh, get into the park for free and be able to camp in the park for free. Um, that's all going to have to be arranged through regional coordinators uh, in relation to the park, but that's going to be one of their big roles. Park staff, of course, are going to be involved in collecting data. Um, they're going to be doing other things, interpretive programs, telling people about the atlas and other, and about the birds in the park. Um, we're also, the parks have, they, it differs from place to place, but they have boats and such that in past atlases, they've been very helpful in helping us get into places that would be otherwise quite difficult to reach. And again, we're hoping uh, that will be a role for them. All right, we have someone who wants to join the sewage lagoon team. <laughs> and help with that. So oh, should I just, well, should we say, just send uh, an email to the Atlas group? Yes. Yeah, okay. Great. Um, and uh, here's a question. Do people who registered for Atlas 2 need to re-register for Atlas 3? Yes. Yes. Um, and then there's somebody here who's just started out as a birder and wants to be able to um, we're that mentoring program that we're talking to. So that would be through the regional coordinator. Yes. Yes. That, that would be really good. Let them know. And with the COVID, again, with COVID, it's going to be um, challenging, but uh, we'll, we'll work out a way of making sure that there's physical distancing and uh, proper precautions are, are taken. But um, we're hoping this will be an important part of the, the project and really encourage new birders to uh, to do this we haven't yet sort of put out the words of the experienced birders that we want them to be met, uh, mentors but that's going to come over the next couple of months all right um and there's somebody who is a student uh at algonquin college who'd like to get involved in possibly with the coordination of the program so again that's where send us an, send a note to the atlas email address um, and I'll make sure that those are posted in the comment, like in the description of the uh, the video. I'll post all of the things, uh, the ways to contact people uh, there so you can do that. So if you have specific things you want to volunteer for within the Atlas program, um, you can send it to that Atlas email. And Kaylin uh, will be happy to um, answer you and, and get you connected with the right people, right? Yeah. Hey, Kaylin, is Kaylin still there? Yeah. There she is. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm still here. 
So yeah, Kaylin, took, Kaylin will be the, the one who would be really happy to uh, field a lot of those questions for you. So send her an email. Yeah, yeah definitely. And just to emphasize, though, if, if it's a local question, to talk to your regional coordinators and work there. We're, we're hoping we don't get thousands of people coming directly to the office because it would be a little overwhelming. But the regional coordinators can fill you in on most aspects of the project that are pertinent to you in the local area. Yeah, I think I it's can a, post the link to the website um, maybe in the chat with the contact. Perfect, that would be great. Thanks, Kaylin. All, right. All right, well, we're going to get close to wrapping this up. Are there any other burning questions before we let Mike go for the evening? Uh, we'll just give it a second or two here and see if we've got any other questions. There's lots of great questions tonight. And, you know, we had over 220 people logged in mike so i think great. that's great. great people are excited about the the atlas and um i think it's going to be a fun few years getting out there and seeing what's available and what's going on i i'm looking forward to finding chats at peely that's that's my goal that would be good all right um we have one last question would be would it be possible to work as an assistant to one year and then a principal atlas or the next year? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, if you um, talk to your regional coordinator that you, um, they can probably put you in touch with someone you can uh, help work with. And um, as your skill set grows, you'll, you'll know when you sort of get to the point where you can identify the birds well enough that uh, you want to take on a square, then let your regional coordinator know. Excellent. All right, well, I think we're gonna wrap things up for the evening. Thank you so much, Mike, for coming and sharing your passion for this project with us. Um, I think we're all looking forward to being involved and Kaylin's posted that contact page in the chat. So uh, 